Welcome and good evening. My name is Samir Gandesha and I am the um, director of the Institute for the Humanities uh, here at SFU. I'm also a professor in the Department of Humanities. Um, I'm extremely delighted to uh, welcome you to our um, Zoom webinar this evening um, entitled Ferry Creek and the Climate Emergency. Um, before I go any further, um, I'd like to acknowledge this event as being hosted on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish uh, peoples, um, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I'm especially, you know, uh, pleased at the fact that there's been so much interest in this event, um, which we only put together last week, so there's not been much time to publicize it. Uh, there's something like, uh, there's over 300 people registered for the event. Um, which really shows how important um, uh, the people consider the future of the old growth forest at Ferry Creek um, to be. And all the associated um, uh, questions that surround uh, the, um, the blockade uh, and the way in which the government and police have, um, have, have handled it, the situation as well as the courts. Um, the panel brings together so many of the themes that we've um, been engaged with at the Institute uh, over the past decade. Uh, extractivism, um, its role in the Canadian state, its role in accelerating climate change, and of course its horrendous impacts on um, First Nations uh, across the country. Um, particularly with respect, uh, and this was you know, six years ago, really an important issue for us. Um, particularly with respect to the 2015 anti-terror legislation, which a leaked RCMP uh, memo revealed um, was directed um, directly against uh, indigenous land defenders. Um, so we've been interested and in, in engaged with questions of policing, authoritarianism, uh, and press freedom. Um, press freedom is an absolutely key uh, aspect of what we've been doing. The freedom of the press is central to our uh, liberal democracy well, I mean, what's looking increasingly like illiberal democracy. I'll leave you um, with a quote from Maria Ressa, who was, uh, along with fellow journalist Dmitry Muratov, uh, recently awarded a Nobel Prize for Literature, which recognized the unique dangers faced by journalists around the world, including, of course, in this country, Canada. And it's a bit of a long quote, but bear with me. Um, so in a battle for facts, I guess what this just shows is that the Nobel um, Peace Prize Committee realized that a world without facts means a world without truth and trust. And if you don't have any of those things, you certainly can't conquer coronavirus, you can't conquer climate change. I've been saying this over and over, and it feels a little bit like, you know, Sisyphus rolling the rock up the hill. And when you get attacked in the process of trying to, rock, trying to roll the rock up the hill, you just kind of dodge. You keep going, you keep going, and it's a shock. But the fact that a journalist from the Philippines and a journalist from Russia won the Nobel Peace Prize tells you about the state of the world today and the state of the Philippines. End quote. At the Institute, we're often accused of not providing a balance or a holistic viewpoint that includes all of the pers perspectives. For example, when we screened a film critical of a Canadian mining company's practices in Greece, there were calls to have representatives uh, from the company present to answer the criticism. Our view is that the um, perspectives of Canadian industry and government um, are already very well, uh, if not over uh, represented in public discourse. And therefore our role is to amplify voices that are heard less often, if at all. This then, we think, makes a small contribution in the direction of establishing balance. We are both against the narrowing of the ambit of what can and cannot be said, while also trying to provide spaces um, within which to hear from voices of resistance. Now, before I introduce and turn the floor over to our uh, moderator, uh, I'd like to thank um, the following um, uh, people for helping to bring this panel together very speedily. Uh, we thought that the, the, the issue is so crucial and, and we were just in the process of organizing it when the court uh, renewed the injunction. So the urgency of our panel has only increased, but we felt it already. So that's why we had to do this very quickly. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hugely um, thankful uh, for, uh, for Rita Wong's assistance 
uh, for Derek O'Keefe's assistance. Uh, Leila Sujir was, was instrumental. Yazin Pirani, um, Ora Kogan, and Huyen Pham, who's a communications coordinator for the Institute, who has helped pull many other such events together um, in, in very short notice. I'm, I'm extremely thankful for all of the above. And I'm also uh, extremely grateful for our co-sponsor, Ricochet Media, which has done such important work covering not only this uh, issue of Ferry Creek, but so many other issues that are ignored by the establishment media. So Ricochet Media plus many other independent media outlets, I think they need so much support today to provide something like possibly a balanced perspective. Um, so now just to introduce uh, our moderator for this evening, um, Rita Wong is somebody I've known at least since she played a key role in the Institute's State of Extraction Conference in 2014. She's an associate professor in critical and cultural studies at Emily Carr um, University who respects the relationships between contemporary poetics, water justice, ecology, and decolonization. She has been actively involved uh, in both uh, Ferry Creek and the Site Sea Struggles. She's been involved at Burnaby Mountain where she was arrested. She's very much involved, very engaged um, uh, in, in these questions and it's just a, a real um, privilege to have you here to moderate uh, this session. So um, Rita, the, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome. And I just want to say what an honor and a pleasure it is to be facilitating this conversation tonight. Um, every time that I have been up to Ferry Creek or Adaitz, um, I have really been moved by the power of the land itself, how it draws people together from all four directions to stand with Pachadat uh, land protector and elder Bill Jones and with hereditary chief uh, Victor Peter. Uh, I'm coming uh, to this today from unceded Coast Salish, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territories. And I think that when we do these land acknowledgements, it is a reminder that we have a responsibility to be better relatives with um, the original peoples of the lands that we live on, and that that is an ongoing and daily commitment to do better. Um, the ancient forests, as we know, have experienced immense violence with colonization, yet people come to try to heal the land again and again. Um, there is, for instance, a sacred indigenous garden in the midst of the clear cuts at Ferry Creek. There's uh, a, a red dress installation in the middle of another clear cut honoring the spirits and the lives of the murdered and missing indigenous women who've been stolen from us by colonial violence. And every time that I've gone up to Ferry Creek, I have always been moved by the creativity, the love and the care that land defenders show to each other and also to the land. Um, and with over 1100 arrests now, people continue to be really steadfast in the rain, in the face of police brutality and all of that. And I have to say that it's been very distressing to see how the RCMP have been targeting uh, BIPOC land defenders, as well as media uh, people with violence and intimidation tactics. Uh, millions are being spent on three different police forces, the Community Industry Re Response Group, the so-called Emergency Response Team, and the Division Liaison Team, uh, basically to clear cut some of the last remaining old growth forests we have um, to make the climate emergency that we're in even worse. And the police, as we know, have been so egregious that the uh, injunction expired and then a new one was sought and gained uh, just recently. Um, and so I, I think we understand that for us, na not, nature is the bottom line. And as we face more deadly heat waves, forest fires and extreme weather, um, the best climate action that we have in front of us it requires respecting indigenous land uh, defenders and knowledge keepers like Bill Jones. So um, I really want to hold uh, my hands up to Elder Bill uh, for bringing us together, for uh, giving us a way to assert our love uh, for the land and for each other and for future generations. It's uh, what's happening up at Ferry Creek is a direct refusal of colonization's divide and conquer mentality. Um, as Katie George Jim has put it, it's not so much about banned politics being resolved, it's about conditions of colonialism being addressed. Uh, this is by design and to put family against family. And so there's a lot of healing work that has been happening um, and I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and I want to uh, just briefly introduce our panelists tonight or our speakers. Um, 
And we'll start with Elder Bill Jones uh, from the Pachadat First Nation, a leading member of the Rainforest Flying Squad, uh, fighting for the survival of Adaits or Fairy Creek. Um, and Elder Bill Jones leads Return to Eldership Circles uh, at Fairy Creek HQ every Saturday, where everyone is welcome to stand with the ancient forests in a respectful and loving way. Um, Rainbow Eyes uh, is a land defender at Fairy Creek and a member of the Danakstawetlala First Nation. Um, and I apologize if I didn't get it right, but I'm trying. Um, near Night Inlet on Vancouver Island. She's also a cancer survivor who understands how precious life is and how precious the land is um, for those yet to come. Jerome Turner is a journalist at Ricochet. He covers uh, national and provincial issues with the emphasis on First Nations stories. Uh, born and raised in Hazleton, he's of Gitsan and Swedish descent. Uh, he authored uh, an essay with uh, Ora Corgan called At Fairy Creek Indigenous Land Defenders Are on the Front Lines of Climate Justice. And he also won the Canada, Canadian Association of Journalists President's Award for his coverage of the RCMP raid on Wet'suwet'en land defenders in 2020. Um, I guess that's really only a year ago, but it feels like a long time. Uh, Aaron Neil Bourne is an Afro-Indo-Caribbean small business owner, storyteller, artist, investigative journalist, wizard, filmmaker, uh, illustrator, videographer, and kayak guide, who is working on a short film series uh, that will explore the microcosm that is Fairy Creek. Um, the first installment in his online docuseries is called Cloudy with a Chance of Land Back. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, that's our lineup tonight. We're very lucky. Uh, I will turn things over to Elder Bill Jones, if I may. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome, especially to come to Pachina First Nation territory and defend at least the last of the old growth. I'm uh, 81. I uh, survived the Alberta Indian Residential School, finished high school there. I um, be became an airplane mechanic initially, and then um, a practical nurse, and um, came home in 1979, been here ever since, and um, have uh, survived also welfare because of uh, um, political alienation in my First Nations band. So ostracization from both um, in my own people and um, this world is um, a long and uh, tedious experience for me that I adopted to personally, I think I understood and what I have hoped for and it all came together at Ferry Creek where I realized that yes this is it and actually I came and other people came and they uh, were also searching and my big biggest conclusion right now is the fact that most young people are coming up for two things dissatisfied with um, the political system, and then also um, the letdown of um, spiritual guidance in uh, the Western world, and that both systems, both uh, parts of our society have failed all people in all ways, and that now we're, because of the um, colonial um, con colonialist control of this these two systems, we are now in the end game and the last struggle to save our old growth. And therein lies my bi biggest welcome to you, to you all. Please come back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I love how you always remind us to come visit the forest. Uh, absolutely looking forward to returning. Um, Rainbow Eyes, would you like to say a few words? Hey, uh, uh, Gayla Kesla, um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, it's so nice to see you, Rita, 
and um, be here with Bill Joss. Such an honor. Um, IBM, it's so great to see you. And Jerome, we saw the front line. Um, yeah, it's just like a reunion. I'm so happy that we can gather here to talk about Fairy Creek because um, it's the ep ep epicenter of change in the world. On so many different levels, we had no idea when we came, when we followed the call from our heart um, and came to Fairy Creek. We had no idea the multi layers that we would begin learning at Fairy Creek. Um, I myself am a land defender of the First Nation. So I went through school at Vancouver Island University to learn how to do water samples, um, tree survey, plant survey, fish surveys, archaeology, all different type of work in our traditional territory of Night Inlet. Um, so to come and meet people on the Pachidat and Dididat First Nations and protect their old growth and connect, no, that's, no, connect more spiritually to myself through the trees and to the people of the forest has been such a gift and I'm so grateful and it's one of the um, greatest gifts of the forest is the connection to ourselves and the moment and man what it really means to be alive it's so beautiful so grateful to hear um yeah it's been so beautiful thank you thanks rainbow eyes um maybe i'll turn it over to Aaron. hi everyone uh welcome to the a very academic ibm log one um as a lot of my homies know, I stay with the books on me, so I'm actually going to open up with uh, a couple quotes that I think are pretty relevant to Fairy Creek. Um, this first one here is from Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. Spoiler, yes, they are. <laughs> but um, towards the end of the book, she starts speaking about um, the relationships linking corporations, government, correctional communities, and the media. So specifically what we've seen a lot of at Ferry Creek is we have a very militarized RCMP that are agents of the government protecting a corporation. And for some reason, a lot of people are very surprised that they're seeing this, but um, <laughs> there is an absolute shocking wealth of information warning about this happening. Um, a lot of it actually does come out of the West Indies and the Caribbean where I come from. So uh, further on, I'll just go into what she says. But uh, what may be even more important to our discussion is the extent to which both share important structural features. Both systems generate huge profits from processes of social destruction. Precisely that which is advantageous to those corporations, elected officials, John Horgan was set, and government agents who have been obvious stakes in the expansion of these systems begets grief and devastation for poor and racially dominated communities in the United States and throughout the world. So, um, yeah, you know, we're just seeing business as usual out here. And I just hope that um, after we talk a little bit more about it here, people will stop being a little um, caught up in the surprise and just ready to start mobilizing against it. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Jerome? Hello. Um, Jerome Turner here. I'm Gitsen. Uh, my Gitsen name is Kaim Noish, Kaim Wilp Lutzkudziwis. Um, we call our land Lachiep. Um, yeah, just very, very happy to be here. I echo uh, a lot of the sentiments already said by our panelists and just ready to get going here. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, I thought I might start with just a, a question if folks are okay to share, um, like a moment that you've experienced or observed uh, at Fairy Creek that has really stuck with you. Um, that you might want to share with other folks. Uh, and I know when you're there a lot that there's so much that goes on, like one day can feel like, you know, a year sometimes. Um, but uh, I think we've lost a couple of people um, and I hope they come back in. Um, 
but maybe I'll I'll turn it over to you first, Aaron, and we'll just uh, kind of go from there because you've been documenting so much. Like it's a lot to process, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot that's been happening, but um, I guess we'll go with something happy, something nice. <laughs> uh, there was one uh, one evening I found myself called up to waterfall camp. I didn't know why I had to be there. I just people told me it was the place to be and um what i didn't know was this night um people were actually planning a big push and they were gonna try and take back a lot of the road and this was the start of what would become like a series of blobs and linky army um maneuvers i guess you could say that would keep rcmp on the back pedal for a couple weeks and um it was one of the most beautiful exercises in peaceful protesting that I've ever seen. Um, and it really did show to me the power of the people when you have about 40 people just calmly walking with maybe one officer, two officers yelling at them to stop. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that moment. Um, and uh, it always, it reminds me of the things we can achieve together that we can't achieve alone. Like just seeing the footage of it is, is just really inspiring actually. Um, and I think that, you know, that gives us or gives people the strength to keep going in the face of some really violent and intimidation tactics. Um, uh, Jerome, maybe I'll pass it to you. We actually ran across each other uh, at Ferry Creek a few months ago. We did. <laughs> That's uh, one of the moments that definitely sticks with me. I remember uh, that was the first day. I can't remember what her name is, the media relations officer. Uh, anybody remember her name? Uh, yeah, she, she came as sort of like a, a Band-Aid because they had messed up with uh, media relations. And she, she had decided on this one occasion to uh, show, just like take her hat off and show this child and her and his father a uh, picture in her hat of her own child. And it was, it was interesting because that, that father had just been saying about 10 minutes earlier about how, how afraid his, his son was of the police officers and what they were doing, what, what his son was witnessing. He wasn't, he wasn't very cool with um, how the police were conducting themselves and for her to go up to this child and say, look at my kid. I have a kid too. It's like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to, how to like articulate like how, how dangerous that is to try and, I don't know, wrap, bubble wrap what they were doing. <laughs> Um, but as a as a person uh, who does media and who was there for a good long stint, like over a month, uh, all all told, at the early early stages, my first uh, my first instance where I saw the police show themselves again, and I'm going to focus on the police a lot here, <laughs> um, was when uh, they kept on putting out media releases at the beginning of every day, telling us media where to be, uh, where to meet them. They would be taking us in, but they would never say anything about uh, the cake use area, they, where they were doing extractions of people who were in tree sits or uh, the aerial, aerial folks. Um, but on, at the same time, that at waterfall camp, the first time that they really mobilized against the uh, people there, there was a guy in uh, Flying Dragon, I forget his name, but uh, they basically lied directly to all media present. They said, okay, no more, no more arrests happening today. And they basically drove us all back because it was, a, it was a good, good distance to uh, where our vehicles were at the bottom of the hill. And uh, basically as soon as we got to within, uh, cell phone range or yeah we started hearing reports that they were extracting that guy from the flying dragon so like they kept 
they kept using words like fluid and fluid situation. We don't always know where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing. But to me, as a person that deals in logistics in another industry, like you, you know where you're going to be doing stuff. You know what you're going to be doing. So I just not just calling them out on basically lying to us, to our faces multiple days in a row. And that was the beginning of that in this instance at Ferry Creek. Mystery. Yeah. Um, both uh, misdirecting people, but also like not allowing journalists to be close to what's happening. You know, we've heard so many countless terrible stories about that. Um, Rainbow Eyes, welcome back. Um, just asking what you've experienced or observed or felt when you've been up at Fairy Creek, like a, a moment that you might feel like sharing. And you have so many moments, <laughs> uh, but one that you feel like sharing with this group of people. Let's see. Um, I guess it would be um, at the front lines. Um, on a weekend action, um, right, probably mid-August, early August, before things got crazy um, and intense and the RCMP started to be especially um, brutal and terrorize the force defenders. So I feel like what started happening on the front lines is on on the movements when the elders for the ancient rainforest came for came from victoria and we started doing we started going to the front lines we started going to the rcmp um something started happening with us that we started to realize that we held the power we started being comfortable um, at Ferry Creek because we knew we had been invited by Elder Bill Jones because we knew um, we had we had gotten comfortable at Ferry Creek and we knew we have to protect the forest so it was like months into enforcement and we started to get comfortable around the RCMP. We knew we didn't really have to listen to them all the time. We knew that they were liars. Like it, something happens when you realize that the RCMP, many of them are full of BS. It's something when you yourself realize this, but when a group of forest defenders, um, beautiful, strong people realize this all together in a group during an action, like on on a Saturday action, the power that is created by these people is incredible. It will blow your mind. It's better than any drug. It's better than any substance. It's called life. It's called living for something that means more than words can express. We're standing up for the trees. We're standing up for a system that's messed up. And we're standing up against um, mostly men, a few women who are mentally unstable as RCMP officers. And we had started to learn that we didn't have to listen to them all the time. And this, it's, it's just, it was so beautiful. Um, the ceremonies that we had, um, we're so powerful and connecting to spirit and the trees and just being out there on the mountain, protesting together with all ages, um, my generation, younger children, and up to the elders. As we all did this together, standing up to a broken um, enforcement that was wrong and knowing we were in the right was so powerful and beautiful and my personal opinion when we realized we had the power the rcmp felt this as well and it was soon after these weekend movements that went so well that the rcmp um something happened and a few really couldn't handle it and that's when the macing started and that's when the real brutality started because it's because in my opinion my personal opinion 
is because a few of those RCMP officers could not handle the fact that the forest defenders of Ferry Creek had stood in their power and they would not listen to the RCMPs anymore. And they, we know where our power is as the people. We are the people. We aren't in the wrong. And we're realizing it at Ferry Creek. And it drove those RCMPs, you know, to the brink. And that's when the brutality started. But um, those, those weekend movements were beautiful, life-changing days where you f we felt more alive than we ever have before. It was, it was beautiful moments, beautiful moments like that. Yeah, thank you, Rainbow Eyes. Um, I, I think, like I mentioned at the start of the intro that there are many different police uh, units up there. there. There's the gray and the green and the blue. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure if you want to comment on this, Jerome, but the... Um, uh, the CIRG, the Community Industry Resource Group, they were very brutal uh, up at Wet'suwet'en. And um, they've been, you know, pretty brutal throughout the whole thing. But what I think you were talking about, uh, Rainbow Eyes, is the spreading of that even more widely. Like they've been targeting BIPOC people, you know, um, for a long time, like be before Ferry Creek, right? But like at that moment in August, it like it spread to everybody. And that's kind of when I think people really started to, um, even the judge that didn't, uh, you know, renew that or allow the extension of that um, injunction could see that absolute brutality and that the fact that they weren't even following their own laws and that they were making stuff up and basically being credible bullies through all of that. So, it, like, there are some key differences as well as similarities with Wet'suwet'en. And because you've covered both, Jerome, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I think public access and, and media present are fairly similar at both places. Uh, they're both quite a, quite a distance away from whatever is a, a major center, you know, like, and I think as these RCMP decisions happen because these are these are decisions that the RCMP are making. They're choosing to follow an enforcement order written in an injunction by a judge um, applied for by CGL or Teal Cedar. Um, they could decide not to. They they totally could decide not to. But and in my experience, from what I've seen, is in that decision that they're um, making is it's basically becomes training to them in in every sense of the word um, they they mobilized what was it 60 60 officers uh, to the get them then checkpoint in 2020 and there were four people uh, unarmed people. They had a video camera and a uh, feather, a couple drums. <laughs> and there was a, there was a canine unit, multiple machine guns. Um, but what they learned from those instances, I think it's pretty clear in what they're doing at Ferry Creek is that military style presence of um, a lineup of people dressed in green with machine guns and dogs. The public doesn't, doesn't like that <laughs> like for, for whatever, for whatever it's worth. They, they decided in this enforcement that, uh, that they weren't going to bring the machine guns. They weren't going to bring the dogs. They, they changed their tactics a lot. And because I think it's a lot to do with who they're enforcing against. In uh, Wet'suwet'en area, it was mainly Indigenous people that they were going to arrest. And so that show of force is, is equal. It, it, it gets elevated because the, the force that they're enforcing against is equally greater. But I'm not saying anything about like the spirit and the, and the, and the thrust of the people at Ferry Creek and the allies. What I'm 
specifically speaking about is the indigenous laws and the which is which is what they're fighting against here also as as officers of colonial law they are they are bumping up against that jurisdictional battle in in the most direct way and in Wet'suwet'en um in discussions with Bill I've talked with him a couple times I'm sorry he's not here still <laughs> for in this conversation but uh the the force and strength of Wet'suwet'en law at this present moment is much stronger than the force of Bachidat or Dididat law in the area based on the strength of their active culture. So when when you see that that um, elevated force from from the RCMP that's a direct reflection of the power of what they think that they're coming up against. And it doesn't have to do with, with the actual people that they encounter. It's just like, yeah, that's from my experience. <laughs> Thanks, Jerome. Yeah. The, that question of indigenous law, um, it was, Interesting, and I, I'm, I think somebody's trying to see if uh, Elder Jones can get back in with us, um, and we'll just hope that that works out. Um, the, you know, I, I just wanted to mention, like, hands up is uh, an ongoing call for solidarity up at Wet'suwet'en right now, and you know, really interesting and powerful example of solidarity from the Haudenosaunee people um, going up there and standing with the Wet'suwet'en, and you know that that sense of unity and strength is so um, inspiring. And um, just want to acknowledge that. And um, it has been interesting to see the, the band council issue a declaration of principles. And those principles include respect, uh, taking care of present and future generations, and also that sense of everybody being one or um, in, um, Coast Salish terms, not so much like that we're all connected and that we're, um, you know, we're in it together, whether we like it or not. Um, and that includes not just the human, but the non-human as well. So when we're talking about the trees, you know, it's the screech owls, it's the fungi, it's the lichen, it's, it's the water, it's like all of it, like woven together into this beautiful, um, you know, place. And, you know, uh, it is... Um, I think a testament to Elder Bill's strength that, you know, that he has brought and inspired so many people there. And, you know, it's certainly not my place uh, to, you know, get into what's going on with Pachidat. But I, I do hope that those principles are, are what can bring people together. Um, because there may be, you know, colonial divides that have happened, um, but there may be ways to heal them. And so, I'd like to turn us to thinking about how to, like, what kinds of solutions we'd like to see. But I'm going to turn it over to Aaron first. Hey, I just wanted to jump in about uh, some previous things and what was just said real quick. I think when we do acknowledge people's work on defending this land, we could not forget the, uh, the matriarchs, considering this is a matriarch-led movement. We don't have any of them here. We have countless um, LGBTQ two spirit people out there who've been throwing down and have actually been like chewed up by this movement. Like a lot of um, black women historically and within this movement have had their labor not recognized, not acknowledged. And um, I think before we pat ourselves on the back too much here, we need to slow down and make sure that all these victories were not at the cost of the people who are being exploited. If we're going to be raising money and awareness and all these things um, in the name of these people, we got to actually look after these people. Thank you. That's an excellent point. And yeah. just sorry, with the, with the violence thing, um, <laughs> we've been under brutal violence since 1444. At like the, if you want to give it a date, um, I really don't like the the narrative that all of a sudden the RCMP got more violent is just now all of a sudden people started paying attention to the violence that had happened to a lot of these people we don't ever hear from. So I just wanted to jump that in there real quick. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I absolutely thank you for saying that. Um, and also thank you for witnessing the violence that's been happening and sharing it. Um, I appreciate the stamina and the dedication that that takes. Um, yeah, um, I certainly don't think we're anywhere near ready to pat ourselves on the back, but I, I think it's always a fine balancing act between trying to encourage people to keep going <laughs> and, and also to um, have the reality check of what we're up against over and over and over again. Um, and so I think, you know, I want to acknowledge people power and also the sacrifices of the people who aren't here that I, I think we are trying to support and work with. And, you know, um, there may be more conversations that need to happen uh, according to people's capacity and uh, energy. Um, I wanted to raise the question of what do we want to see happen? Like what would be the best possible outcome out of all of this? Um, uh, so the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, for instance, has um, put out a declaration to protect our old forests, our ancient elder forests. And, um, you know, that that is something that is very clearly a demand, uh, you know, as soon as, uh, thank you, land back, exactly, <laughs> uh, in the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, we could just end it there and say land back, that's it. Um, but I would love to hear from you about what that means to you. <laughs> Uh, and sort of next steps. Uh, if anybody would like just to... specifically about land back or um... <laughs> land back and then also Ferry Creek, like where we where do we want to be a year from now? I think the best possible outcome of this as as a journalist, as a person in media, is the exclusion zones never happen again. Um, uh, journalism, I don't think, was ever supposed to be like a, a career. It was just supposed to be people concerned about something. They put something in a, in, in a paper for everyone to read. Before that, it was the town crier, whatever, you know. <laughs> and it's grown into this thing where uh, advertising has decided to be a massive part of it. And people for whatever reason bow to that and I, I think it should get back to more of people concerned people writing anyway um that's beside the point but as an indigenous person the best po possible outcome would be for me to like specifically in the fairy creek area area of Ashida, Didida, um culture rise and and take that rightful place that they have right now. That's it, that law that that permits people to be there doing what they're doing is older than any nation that thinks that it has power here. <laughs> it, it is, uh, that is the number one outcome that I, I as an indigenous person would hope for. For, for any movement like this, whether it be Elsie Pugtug, Wet'suwet'en, uh, Haudenosaunee, yeah. And for people to, to, to understand that that's where the power comes from in this area and to support that, not be afraid of it. It's, it doesn't mean everyone gets kicked out and has to go home, wherever home is. Like if you grew up here, if you, make your life here. I don't think there's any Indigenous person that I know that's wanting people to go back across the pond, whatever that means. We're, we're in this together. And yeah, I hope that, that we start to enact that. Yeah. Thank you, Jerome. Um, we have some demands in the chat for IBM to come back and speak to the question or anything else you want to speak about. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Aaron. Uh, sorry, what, uh, <laughs> what question was this? Um, what would you like to see happen like in the next <laughs> future, right? And All right. 
in the long term. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come back with the our prisons obsolete. You know, we it's an academic setting. We got to come with the books. <laughs> So this is actually a quote in the book from Arthur Wasco from the Institute of Policy Studies. And uh, it starts with, forget about reform. It's time to talk about abolishing jails and prisons. Uh, it says in American society, but that has invaded all societies. So in all society, uh, where do you put the prisoners, the criminals? What's the alternative? First, having no alternative at all would create less crime than the present criminal training centers do. Second, the only full alternative is building the kind of society that does not need prisons, mm -hmm. i.e. the societies that were here before <laughs> this one came around. Uh, a decent redistribution of power and income so as to put the hidden fire of burning envy that now flames up in crimes of property, both burglary by the poor and embezzlement by the affluent. And a decent sense of community that can support reintegrate and truly rehabilitate those who suddenly become filled with fury or despair and that can face them not as objects criminals but as people who have committed illegal acts as almost all of us have so in short what i need to see in a year <laughs> is abolish the prisons abolish the rcmp liquidate the colony the corporation of canada uh land back <laughs> awesome thank you yeah, defund the police. <laughs> we abolish. Um, we ain't defunding. That that entails something's left. We ain't, we ain't getting anything. <laughs> we want it all back. Land back is everything. Man. Good. Uh, Rainbow Eyes, do you want to weigh in on the question? Yeah. What would you like to see happen in the next year, or um, what solutions do you want to see happening? Um, yeah, what can we ha see happening in the next year? Um, Abolish the police. One of the big things that has yeah, abolished resurgence. the police. Um, yeah, uh, land back. Um, yeah, I agree with everything IBM said. That was great. Um, a, a big thing that's going around camp is like is unity and working together, and this sense of family that we have there growing. Um, it's so beautiful to be able to connect with people at Ferry Creek and just like instantly connect and instantly be working for the same thing. The beautiful thing is that this is spreading through social media. Um, people across Canada, um, across Turtle Island and across the globe are looking at places like Ferry Creek. Um, I recently heard that there are like 51 or 61 um, similar protests across Turtle Island right now. So people all over are, are hearing it in their heart that we must stand up for Mother Earth. A dream and vision I have is like to be a forest defender is going to be cool, like being a rock star. Like, it's cool to go out, leave society, leave it, and go find family in the forest. So in the next year, um, it's, it, it's going to fly. This time flies. But the more awareness that we can, like, um, make, the more people we can connect with, and the more we can spread the fact that saving the planet needs to be done right now, and saving the like the old growth forest, reconnecting to the indigenous cultures and the people, lifting each other up, lifting our people up, um, is the most spiritually and um, spiritually beautiful thing that we can do. Um, it's a win-win. And I like I my favorite thing to say is the trees always had this plan. The ancestors always had this plan for us to go into the woods to find each other, to find ourselves and save Mother Earth. When the time came when we're in a cold red, it's we're in a cold red. It's scary to have rainbow eyes. You have to go through the storm. You have to face the fact that um you know we could be we could be creating 
a living hell on earth. Like it's a scary thing to say. It's a scary uh, word to say. I think it's true. But it's reality. I just saw what does indigenous sovereignty mean to you? Um, I think it means how we were before the colonizers came, how we are when we're left alone, when we're free to practice our cultures freely. Um, and I think it's something that we can regain um, because it's there, it's in the forest, it's, it's, it's there for all of us. It's there for everybody to have indigenous sovereignty. And I just like, I'll keep saying it's, it's, it's connection to spirit. Indigenous sovereignty is free. It's, 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 it's so free and it's not nine to five. It's not Monday to Friday. It's, it's a sovereignty from taxes. It's, and it's the, it's like sovereignty. It's in, it's kind of what we're finding in Fairy Creek. What we're building, the community that we're building is free from the structures of this colonial system. And it's kind of getting close to um, like what I would see indigenous sovereignty to be is nations breaking free from the grasp of money of because that's what we're trapped. We're trapped. We're trapped. We're trapped because we need money. The Patidat, Dididat, my nation, all nations are trapped because we need money to survive. We are put in a corner and we need money. So we're going to take down the trees. It's so unfortunate. That's the situation that we're in. So to find the indigenous sovereignty is to get out of the system. And I think we have to break it. I think we got to break it. Um, and to break it, we have to find ourselves. We have to find spirit and we have to find that connection again and see that we don't need the material. We don't need the money. Um, and we need the matriarchs to help us, <laughs> the beautiful matriarchs to show um, that we have the love and we have the capacity to care for each other and look after each other. It's hard, but we have to look after each other, number one. Um, and that's what we do at Fairy Creek. That's what we're learning. It's it's a spirit school. I, oh, I love that. It's a spirit school. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rainbow Eyes. Um, I am wondering if we should open it up for questions because I think there's a few in the chat. Have you been keeping an eye on, on that? We can open it up for anybody who wants to uh, respond. Um, while you're just sorting through that, I, I wanted to mention that with 1,100 arrests, and I have, I'm somebody who's been through the so-called criminal injustice system because of, you know, um, upholding, I think, my responsibility to Indigenous laws and cultures. Um, I would personally like to see all those charges dropped. I think that would be a, like a sign of uh, so-called reconciliation and so-called acknowledgement that there are Indigenous cultures and laws at play and that um, these are preceding the colonial courts. Um, I don't expect that to happen, but I still want to see it happen. <laughs> you know, that's like a small thing that I would like to see happen. And the big thing, of course, is that the trees are uh, protected for future generations. Like, you know, if I was premier of BC, which I thankfully am not, um, I would declare, you know, a freeze on old, co on old growth, um, I would have done it months ago, <laughs> like uh, no more cutting, right? Um, but anyways, that's that's kind of, you know, I guess my dream. Um, and Samir, do you want to? Yeah, um, I think it would, it would be great to, to uh, get um, Eric Pittman in to the, to the discussion. And he's posted um, an Indigenous protected and um, conserved area is a great solution. We are working to get everyone's cooperation to make it a success. It comes with a prosperity fund to release uh, the Pachidat from uh, oppressive resource extraction agreements they had to sign. Uh, who wants to help? Mears Island is an IPCA and some of those uh, people will help uh, too. So that's, that's a comment. I wanted to get that out there because Eric, I think, was really uh, quite keen on uh, getting into the, the discussion. Thank you, Eric, uh, for that. Um, there was a question from 
Sven Robinson, but unfortunately that is directed at uh, at, um, at at Bill Jones, who's uh, who's not with us any longer. Um, but let me go. Oh yeah, Sven actually has another question. Um, in 1985 at Lyle Island, um, uh, Guai Hanas in uh, Haida Gwaii, and in 1993 at uh, Klakwat Sound, a number of forestry workers joined us in protesting the destruction of the old growth ecosystems there and the lack of respect for indigenous people. Uh, some even did time for that. Um, what has been the experience uh, so far at Ferry Creek? Uh, maybe just open that to the, the panelists. Um, having been there pretty early, uh, I saw several people and met and spoke with several people who had never been part of anything like that before. They they come from Alberta, they come from just down the road at Half Moon Bay, um, foresters, people who that, yeah, that had never even thought about doing that, but they came from a far way away, or even if they were like the young man that I met who was used to be a logger, I think he might even still be a logger. Um, he risks risked and is risking uh ostracization from his from his crew that he's always grown up with and um i think like that that is happening more and more as as the situation becomes more evident like people my people it gets said people have been talking about how how we need to stop and slow down for a very long time. And just like Rainbow Eyes said, we're in a lot of ways trapped too. We used to be forestry, now we're mining. And yeah, when does it, when does it stop? When do we get, uh, I don't know, universal basic income or something like that? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's an answer. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to answer or should we go to another question? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, <laughs> this is actually by request. Um, so I do not want to mislead people. Uh, there is a huge elephant in the room regarding the state of Ferry Creek and how safe it is for Indigenous femmes, Black people. Um, I won't speak to how safe it is to Indigenous femmes as I am not an Indigenous femme. But as a black person, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, just don't go there. You're not going to be safe. People would not have you back. Good luck if you do. <laughs> I can expand if anyone wants me to, but uh, that is the official independent black media statement. That's sad to hear. <laughs> Um, okay, if we could move along, uh, we have another question from Pia Massey, um, and she asks, Rainbow Eyes, uh, all First Nations would have a greater income if the trees remained standing. How about funding to pay back for the land? Um, and I just want to say and put that together with something that Suzanne Simard said earlier today on CBC. She's a forestry professor at, uh, at UBC and, and basically uh, gave figures uh, suggesting that uh, keeping the old growth in place uh, would in fact be more uh, um, uh, uh, valuable in a monetary sense. And I know we're all critical of that, um, but at the same time, this might be a concrete proposal to uh, the government uh, that this would be a way of you know doing the kinds of things that it needs to do, um, create jobs and, and 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 move the economy along and so on. So that would be um, a, a question uh, for for you all. But it, it's initially directed at uh, at Rainbow Eyes, I think. The question is, um, would, would it not be more valuable in any case to have the the, the forest remain standing? Um, uh, from the government's own uh, uh, rationale, which is an economic perspective, uh, which I think you know people around the table in, in the audience are critical of, but in a, in a way, uh, you you have to to some extent um, answer them in 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 uh, in, a, in both an ideal way, but also a pragmatic way. Could that be um, a, a solution? This this is the question. 
to leave the trees standing? Yes, and, and do so on a, a rationale that the government can understand. It's logic, yeah? Yeah. So there's a few people that have, organizations that have come forward that have worked with um, communities in Africa, and they have helped communities start sustainable forestry. This could include um, tourism in the forest, um, like Fairy Creek is stunning, it's beautiful, it would bring people. Um, but I mean, there's so many ideas that could, um, where, the, where, the forest, where the trees could remain, um, the trees don't need to be cut down. Um, yeah, and Rita, you know, I think you, you also see there's quite a number, and, and uh, Rainbow Eyes uh, uh, also noted this, there's a number of comments in, in the chat that we think that uh, sh should um, be put out there for, uh, uh, for independent black media to, to address. They seem very urgent, and, 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 and especially with what you just said, this is very disturbing to hear uh, the, that, um, uh, uh, that black folks don't feel like uh, uh, the others up there have their back. So I think this is something um, would be good to hear you elaborate on. And, and there are comments here. Um, so uh, I think what I, uh, IBM touched on is far more valuable discussion point than the economy. Okay. Uh, and the very system which has established the precursors to why people aren't um, safe on, on land. Yes. Um, there should be room for panels to discuss what's being brought up in the comments. Yes, exactly what we want to do. Um, good. Uh, why don't... So people don't have your back. This is very disturbing to me. This must have happened to you several times due to feel. It is a definite thing. In what ways were you not supported? I am so sorry. Um, so maybe, uh, would you like to elaborate uh, a little bit more um, uh, on that? <laughs> it is uh, very... Sure. <laughs> yeah. um... You know what? We academic. We back to the books. We coming in with a. Uh, we got a how how Europe underdeveloped Africa. This is by Walter Rodney. He was actually assassinated in Guyana, which is where I come from, for uh, trying to set up a Marxist government. So uh, I think the big problem here is why why black people are not safe is a similar reason why a lot of indigenous femmes are not safe or just people who are very outwardly not white looking is because people really don't understand the gravity of what we're up against and what's really going on considering the fact that people are surprised that the rcmp are violent so so um what we're gonna get right into is why are we all here right now <laughs> so what happened is european workers gained a mastery over the means of productions the factories and the mines which means the common working man started getting more money than the monarch at some point so if you ever read in this, uh, uh, Karl Marx, he had a whole theory about how these different classes were going to clash together. And in this glorious revolution, the workers were supposed to become victorious. Uh, the capitalists, who were terribly afraid of this possibility, knowing full well that they themselves seized power from the feudal landlord class by means of revolution, didn't want it to happen to them. So, for example, you can look at the French Revolution. The bourgeoisie, who had made a bunch of money off of overseas territories, so had developed a bunch of slave profit, got a bunch of slave money, but they could only spend this money within France. So they killed the monarchy and took over. So essentially what happened is they became the new monarchy, and now what's happening is we as the people are getting enough intelligence and enough power to actually overthrow these people and take it over. So what they realized is Black people We've been doing this for a very long time. This is in our DNA. We've been doing this for thousands of years. You give us even a little chance. We're going to take it, we're going to do it, and it's going to be victorious. So the only way they can stop this is by bribing the other working class people, offering little things like when you have a judge come out and say, all right, there's no more injunction. Now everyone who is not Black <laughs> and not Indigenous thinks that he's going to keep his word and that this is a real thing and he's been moved all of a sudden by this violence he didn't know was going on. Even though if you're Black, you know they know what's going on because it's been happening to us our whole lives and we've been speaking on it. We've been publishing books about it. 
but no one wants to listen to us because you're either black or a woman. So essentially what's happening is people are really underestimating how much danger we're in when we're out there. A lot of these linky army catastrophes, I'll call them now, only work because the police just go and look. They pick out the one black woman who's usually there or they'll pick out whatever indigenous people who are there who have actually been tokenized by the white media team. So now the police are looking for these people as leaders who are propped up in a, in a decentralized movement. So it's kind of like the best quote I can use, part of my French, is everybody want to be a nigga till it's time to be a nigga. So like everyone wants to be black until the real shit happens and the cops come running. Like I myself, uh, they tried to arrest me once. I'm sorry, not or they tried to kidnap me. They didn't say anything that I was under arrest. They just charged, they just ran about eight officers. Uh, they arrested one indigenous woman. And I would have actually got away if it wasn't for the crowd of white people trying to run in front of me and had actually blocked my path and I got grabbed by police. But luckily, you know, ancestral spirit, I got away. But uh, essentially, just time and time again, the Fire Creek movement has shown that when instances like this do happen, um, they don't really have our back after the fact. It's just kind of like, oh, this will make a really good media story. And then we're done with you. So, I mean, and then time and time again. One second. Sorry. <laughs> so, time and time again, uh, what's happened is there's also been a lot of settlers on the Ferry Creek side who have had a lot of predatory behavior. They've had a lot of, um, they've done a lot of wrong. And then they want to appropriate indigenous customs, like having a circle to skirt responsibility and owning up and being accountable for their actions. And uh, they've often multiple times stated that they don't want to talk about land back. They don't want to talk about defunding the police. They don't want to talk about these real issues that we need to discuss to actually decolonize because it's going to scare away the white people support that they're getting. So, I mean, it's a lot of, it's a lot of different things, but uh, it's just, it is what it is, you know? Is why I'm independent black media. I came here to see, I knew this is what was happening here. I read an endless amounts of books about this happening, but you just have to come see it sometimes. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, would anybody else like to respond? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, all those, all those things are that we're describing are like the how do I put it? The speed, speed bumps of decolonization, or the like, what what needs to happen from what I've experienced and how I was raised in the indigenous worldview is people are different parts of the conversation. There, there are people like IBM myself that have been living this, and we know where we know those those forces are whenever we're around there were, were threats you know like we're, we'll be targeted um and to to be able to include these people that will for whatever reason decide not to hear things like land back things like and defund the police or whatever whatever the message is being called from our, from our communities the like to be able to include them in the conversation in in a way is I think I think that's how we get somewhere and it's really difficult it's really hard to include people that completely have not want nothing to do with what you're what you're proposing but they're still there right they're still in the room there's what they have to understand is that they actually like it's not everybody gets a trophy in in these sorts of things it's it's um you you're in a place and that power from that place needs to be respected first before anything and i'm re <laughs> i'm really sad that bill's not here right now because he he speaks to this much better than i could uh okay well uh, there was a question directed specifically at um uh at the elder bill uh should we 
any hope of a change in the position of um, I suppose the Band Council uh, leadership um, and the other hereditary chiefs? What kind of discussions and dialogue have there been so far in your nation? Um, the current position of our band council, I think, is in the hands of uh, John Horgan, who is a personal friend of uh, our chief, elected chief, Jeff Jones. And, and so they're very much uh, in co-op in cooperation with each other, in cahoots. Mm -hmm. And um, they are also very heavily influenced by Teal Jones, uh, who wrote the contract up that um, it sort of entrapped the um, Pachina First Nation into a very predatory um, um, exchange where our band got next to zero and all and get, giving all and and surrendering all. So we are now virtually um, totally defeated by the, um, I would call it the Indian Act and the uh, government skill at manipulating the Indian Act to, um, to uh, uh, secure the uh, interests of uh, colonialist um, control of our political system. It's uh, much, uh, it's very well demonstrated in British Columbia Legislative Assembly now, where one politician, an observer, said they are simply pushing the papers back and forth and almost winking at each other as as if that there is a, a full cooperation between oh the uh, government and opposition and uh, I think like the, like the olden days of the uh, forest industry, where companies um, uh, favored their agents to move into the union movement. And this is much the same now where, where the where unions control virtually the government agenda in uh, cooperation with their associates in the uh, opposing political party. So that's to me is an, a nutshell of uh, how things are working in our government right now. And it seems as though with the government's inaction and ineptness, they have stalled this off to, of all things, to the, the, to uh, create their own endangerment, where they are now threatened and exposed by both media and police action where now the now the the world is starting to understand how the the federal government via the 
the the Indian Act and the um, that's what it used to be. I can't remember what it's called now. So that is a trickle down effect where the federal government um, favors po political elites as it has been done on my reservation for some 40 years now. And that these people have been um, lobbied and manipulated by the uh, first of DC government in their um, oh well stabilizing the very unfair system of uh, elitist politics virtually uh, in my estimation uh, a neo-fascist state uh, pr um, that is um, backed up and, in and enforced by the federal government, the provincial government, and least on the bottom of their orders is our Pachina Band Council, uh, along with Teal Jones, um, and still using the same system, the colonial system that has started since probably since the creation of the Northwest Company that became the Hudson's Bay Company, there, where the um, political system has been um, refined to, to retrench and, and stabilize and ruthlessly control the colonialist economic extraction system. I think I better leave it at that right now before I start <laughs> preaching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Elder Jones. I am wondering, there are a lot of questions. We're not going to get to all of them. Um, but I, I'd like to maybe bring us back to the question of the barriers to becoming a land defender. Uh, you know, we've heard uh, from IBM about some of the challenges on the front lines and Jerome as well. Um, and the, you know, the speed bumps or the of uh, working together to overcome, uh, you know, the violence of the colonial state is uh, something that this panel has really um, helped us to start thinking through. It's a huge, long conversation and it won't be easy. Um, but I, I really appreciate people's honesty, uh, their frankness, um, and the need to keep going in the face of the police intimidation that we see. Um, like, so these are these raise questions of how do we keep each other safe? How do we stand with each other when you know there's a lot of work to be done individually uh, in terms of decolonizing? And also, um, you know, how do we stand with uh, Elder Jones? and all the folks that are, you know, doing their best to protect this really sacred place. Um, it's important to, you know, work through the hard things so that we can come together for that, um, that larger long-term intergenerational healing that um, we're hoping to support, you know, difficult as that may be. Um, and I'm not, I don't have any easy answers, but I, I do know that we need to come together from all four directions because there are things we can do together that we can't do alone. And um, it won't be easy. It isn't easy. Uh, it has never been easy. Um, but um, I just want to thank all of you for not giving up on the land, not giving up on each other. Um, and I just want to also say a little shout out to Lady Chainsaw, <laughs> who's been up there a lot and uh, was hospitalized for it. And um, her ferocity of spirit, I think, is, is part of what carries us through. Um, and I, uh, you know, it's messy, it's painful, but it's also really alive, like Rainbow Eyes was saying. There's a lot of life 
in the movement. Um, there's a lot of conflicts that are real. There's a lot of love that is also real. And, you know, there's all of that all at once. It, it's a magical place. If you haven't been to Fairy Creek, I want to encourage you to go. Um, I'm wondering if we could, uh, how short we are on time we need to end, and if we could close with a prayer, if that would be appropriate. Um, uh, um, Elder Bill, if, if you would be comfortable offering a prayer, or if somebody else would like to offer a prayer. Um, just to connect us with our ancestors and with those yet to come. Myself, I, 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 I would like to um, have Bo Rainbow Eyes volunteer a prayer for us. <laughs> hey, thank you. Hey, <laughs> um, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Got it. Um, Okay, we breathe deep and we all give thanks to Elder Bill, to all of the Patchy Dad and the Diddy Dad, for the ancestors, for caring for the land that we are now on, that we now live on, that we now fight for. For the ancestors who took care of the water, who chose so carefully each and every single tree that they decided to take. Elder Bell once said that he, the people used to dance around the tree and this is how they fell a tree. And over the years, and this is how they chose the tree, they would dance around it year for two years and this is how they fell the tree to honor this, to honor this time that our ancestors took with the trees, how they respected nature. I want to send a prayer out to the entire globe for us to feel this connection to the earth again, to the trees again, to the life under the soil, to respect all of the life that comes from the forest and the community that we do not understand, that lives and breathes under our feet a prayer for each other, for unity, for connection, for understanding, for compassion, so that we can come together and save Mother Earth because we are in a code red. We need to do this right now. But the ancestors are holding us. The time is now. The time is perfect. We're not too late. The time is now. The time is perfect. We are held. So, um, a prayer. Thank you for Rita. Thank you for doing this. This has been so beautiful. Jerome, IBM, Samir, um, Simon Fraser University, and everybody listening. Thank you so much for the Fairy Creekers, the frontline workers, the forest defenders that fight so hard. It's getting cold. They're out there right now. Sending love, sending love bubbles to everybody up on the mountain. Yeah, everybody everywhere. Love bubbles all around. <laughs> and Uncle Stacy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sweet. Be <laughs> big with you, rascals. We got them. We'll see you soon. We got them. We got them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gala Kessler, we do. And thank you, everybody. Elder Bill. Um, uh, IBM, Jerome, uh, Samir, Devin, and everybody in the audience, thank you for the questions and thank you for your patience with all the technical difficulties we faced uh, tonight and also with the ongoing questions. Uh, CLR James, A History of Pan-African Revolt. Awesome. Thank you. And Angela Davis, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Rodney. I'd also like to thank everybody for um, participating on the panel. Um, Aaron, Jerome, Rita, uh, Rainbow Eyes, uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, Bill, thank you very much. It was a huge honor to have you uh, uh, present uh, as well. Um, and thank you to our co-sponsor, uh, Ricochet Media. Keep, keep doing the great work that you, you're doing. And um, thanks to the audience for being here. You've, you've given us a lot to think about. 
Uh, I've learned an enormous amount on this panel, so thank you all, and I hope you'll come back to uh, to subsequent um, uh, talks and, and panel discussions, film screenings, and so on that we do at the Institute. Okay, well, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peace, peace. Black people, community work. Build up your own communities. That's what we're doing this year. Yeah. And next year. And every other year. Hello. Land back. Land back one last time. <clears throat> one last thing is <laughs> land back. If, if land. you're wondering if capitalism is working, ask an indigenous person. <laughs> Indeed. Yep. And I'm most flattered to be included in your group. We are most honored, Bill. Thank it you so be an, for being here with us. <laughs> Rita, thank you for, for all that you've done. Um, wonderful to, to, to see you, uh, meet you online, uh, hopefully in person. Also, Aaron, I hope we can meet one day uh, in, in person. Talk about Angela Davis, whom I'm teaching this semester, and some of the students uh, uh, we're present, uh, and um, we, we have lots, lots more to talk about in class. So thank you oh, for word. bringing her into the discussion like that. It was great. Cool. <clears throat> All right, I think it's dinner time. So okay. yeah. thank you. Yep, I think so. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.